Hello there everyone, I am very, very excited about the object in today's episode of Objectivity. It is this periodic table. This is from when the periodic table was like a new thing that had only just been invented. It was discovered in storage in a lecture theater at the University of St. Andrews. They're having it restored at the moment by an independent paper conservator. This man here, Richard Hawkes, you as a paper conservator must have looked at this and thought, this is a big deal. Well, absolutely. The periodic table that we're looking at was probably used as a lecture diagram or hung in a laboratory at the university for quite a large part of its life. And in order to do that then, to make it suitable to hang, the paper would have been backed on a sort of linen or cotton canvas, and then it would have had these wooden battens attaching to the top and bottom. We don't have the batten for the top that it hung from, but this would have been acting as a weight, if you like, to unroll the diagram and allow it to hang flat on the wall. Here is the old piece of canvas that it came off. Just keep it away because it's a little bit dirty, but you can see the discoloration on the back and the dust that had gathered on it. Over time, this has become rather weak and brittle, and you can see now that it is so weak it just wants to tear apart. Okay. It doesn't look in great condition, does it? Like bits are falling off and... No, of course it's been exposed to the atmosphere around it. It wasn't glazed in a frame, so the paper has turned a darker brown. I don't think it was ever a bright white paper, but it has discoloured through a combination of photooxidation from exposure to light and perhaps the acidity that was inherent within the paper and from the canvas. And then what did you have to do to get this thing cleaned? It was necessary to remove all of the loose surface dirt and dust and grime that had accumulated. You can see there are some chalk inscriptions that have been added at a later date here. Noble gases, I see here. Absolutely. Yeah. So as elements were being discovered, they were being amended on this periodic table. Uh, Krypton there, xenon. I had to weigh up the risks of carrying out an aqueous treatment that might affect some of the chalk, but the paper was in such poor, brittle condition and it will be necessary to carry out some sort of lining to consolidate and bring this whole jigsaw puzzle back together that I felt it would be wrong not to carry out some sort of washing treatment to remove as much of the soluble discoloration as possible. But more importantly, and this is where the chemistry is in the paper conservation, is to raise the pH of the paper, and try to introduce some calcium and magnesium salts into the paper, which have been shown to help with its long-term aging. So this treatment now has got to that stage where it has been washed and it's also been deacidified. That was done by immersion in a dilute solution of magnesium bicarbonate or magnesium hydrogen carbonate. Look at you using your periodic table now. Well, it's, here we are, it's, it's here in black, <laughs> black and white. So that will have left behind an alkaline residue within the paper of magnesium carbonate. The next stage then will be to try to bring together some of these many different little pieces which were only held together with the canvas backing that was there as well as those you can see I've even got a little petri dish here with more pieces in. I've recorded where all of these will be going. The ultimate jigsaw puzzle. To repair it I'll be using a combination of wheat starch as an adhesive and Japanese papers that is papers that are made from paper mulberry and are quite soft and long fibred and relatively pure in content to form little strips to bridge some of these tears and they'll be applied on the back to hold together all the pieces. Once I've reassembled most of the larger pieces I will then progress to putting a lining on of several sheets of Japanese paper. Now of course one thing everyone's going to notice is it's not in English. Do you want to do the honours with the pronunciation there? <laughs> well I'm not sure I do even <laughs> though I have spent some time working in Germany. Looking down at the bottom here you'll see the details of its origins. So here we've got the publisher as I understand it, Lenoir and Forster, a publishers in Vienna. On the other side you've got the details of the printer. So this is made in Austria, okay then. Now we're going to have a separate video about this periodic table on my chemistry channel, which is called Periodic Videos. So there'll be links on the screen and in the description. But let's have a quick look now at a few things of interest. Now Mendeleev himself came up with the periodic table, I think in 1865. There's his name, of course, Mendeleev. Gallium was discovered about 10 years later, 1875, I think. And we have gallium on the table here. 11 years after that, in 1886, germanium was discovered, but we have not got germanium here. We have a blank space. So we're looking probably sometime between 1875 and 1886 for this periodic table. Also, they say there's no J on the periodic table. There's a J on this one for iodine. Do you have a favorite element? Well, I suppose the most common chemical 
element that we talk about is calcium. It was research done in the 1920s and 30s at the Library of Congress that found that papers that contained a higher level of calcium aged in a much better way than papers with a lower pH that maybe had had calcium removed from them. I think what we're looking at really is science working through problems. So I like the fact that it's incomplete and that the scientists, the chemists, are beginning to search for the missing elements and beginning to write in some of the gases as they're discovered on here as well. So we're seeing living history, really. All of these losses down the edge, if I don't have pieces to go back in, and I know there isn't a piece to fit in to every loss, they will have some tone fills put in. So it should look a lot more whole when it's complete and will certainly look a little bit more stable. I would be nervous. I would be scared of ripping it or putting it in water and all the ink disappears or something like. If I start to think too much about its value, whether that's commercial value or whether in this case it's its historical value, then yes, it becomes very difficult to operate and carry out treatment. So I, I try to keep level-headed about it. Now, just as a little bonus, we've got another chart that Richard's been conserving also for the University of St. Andrews. Do you think you might show us that one? Absolutely. Okay, so here we go. We have another scientific chart. Look at this. Let's see how quickly people can figure out what this is as it gets unrolled. It's not immediately obvious if you can't read the text. It looks something between a road map and a tree. What is this? Well, as I understand it, this is a coal tar tree, but this is the, the family tree for coal tar derivatives. That would include a lot of the aniline dyes that interest me because they were used for creating some new pigments and colors for artists to use in the middle of the 19th century. Okay, so we start with coal tar down here at the trunk, and then we see all these thick branches coming off like first running and light oils, or up further here, heavy oils. So these are the things you're taking out of the coal tar, and then what you in turn take out of that. And these coloured pigments, they seem to come off this first running and light oils, and then these other subsequent branches. It's so detailed. I do feel this almost has more aesthetic value. There's something, there's a pleasure in just creating something beautiful. It's a bit like a Where's Wally. I think there should be a Wally hiding somewhere in here, but... <laughs> And the edges here look a bit sort of frayed and cracked. Are you worried about those? Or you... Yeah, there's fairly common damage again. You can see from just handling and mechanical rolling and unrolling. So I think as a treatment option, it would be possible to use a solvent to remove the shellac. It's soluble in ethanol, so we might be using industrial methylated spirit. And it then might be necessary to think about any repair work. Well, there we go. It is a very beautiful item. Before today, obviously, I had heard of the periodic table, but the genealogical tree of coal tar, that's new to me. For Professor Polyakov's take on this periodic table, check out the links on the screen and in the video description. And we'd also like to thank 23andMe for sponsoring this video. This is the online genetic service that will help you learn what the 23 pairs of chromosomes that make up your DNA can teach you about your ancestry, traits, and health. To help with scientific research or maybe just learn your own personal DNA story, go to 23andMe.com objectivity.